All right, good afternoon. Uh, hey, if any of you feel compelled to uh, move forward, since it's kind of a uh, sparse audience here, we might as well do that. So uh, if you want to, I'd come on, come on, let's be family. Thank you. The, the, the other thing uh, that's dangerous is that uh, uh, I teach at, uh, at Kellogg and Stanford, so I, I, I feel very, very comfortable cold calling on the audience. So we're going to probably do a little bit of that. Anyway, uh, my name is Dave Chen. Uh, I'm uh, with Equilibrium Capital Group. We are a, uh, uh, a uh, global asset management platform of sustainability-driven uh, real assets. So we have agricultural portfolios, green real estate portfolios, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it's been, uh, it's my pleasure today to, uh, and we're having a good time up here because uh, it's uh, three friends. And, uh, and uh, let me introduce uh, the, the folks, uh, Kelly James, Craig Wichner, and Brooke Randall. And uh, what we have today is the privilege of drilling into the issue of agriculture as an investment category, uh, sustainable agriculture, and why would agriculture be part of an impact portfolio? And uh, hopefully we'll also pick at some very sensitive social and environmental issues with regard to agriculture. And, uh, and what we're very, very, uh, I think, uh, privileged to have today is uh, Kelly represents uh, one of the most innovative, I think, startups in this area, which is actually collecting uh, and creating a trading platform for the organics and other crop types in the fair trade, et cetera. So this would be, uh, think of this as uh, bringing the Chicago Merck to the organic field, and we'll have Kelly um, uh, talk a little bit about that. But the other thing that I think uh, Kelly has is truly one of the few uh, uh, platforms that gives you visibility on both the supply side and the demand side of what's happening in the organic industry, whether it's from the dairies all the way through to the grains. All right, so tremendous visibility, and, and, and as we were joking, why do you always have to be so data-driven? So, uh, and then Brooke and Craig represent asset managers. So they're actually uh, investing portfolios and uh, dollars uh, in uh, sustainable agriculture. And so we've got an investor, we've got trends that are happening out literally in the dirt, and then we've got a global view of what's actually happening in the uh, supply demand side. With that, uh, I'm gonna ask each of them to introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about their company, and then we're gonna dive into some questions. All right, well, thank you, wonderful crowd. It's really great to be here. Um, let me just tell you just a little bit about my background. I spent five years at a company called the Chicago Climate Exchange, and this was a startup that let people trade a cash market for greenhouse gases. So uh, carbon, uh, should say cash and futures market. Carbon, sulfur, NOx, we had a clean energy index. Um, and the theory behind this was to put a price on what had previously been an externality, that is carbon emissions. So you give it a price, you let people trade it, you let people manage risk, uh, you give them, they, there's a financial benefit if they reduce the amount of pollution, and there's a financial cost if they don't. So it becomes something that's no longer invisible, it's on someone's balance sheets. And Mercaris is, I like to call it a second cousin of that, because it's still about pricing an asset or externalities that were either unpriced or very opaque. Uh, so the idea is that uh, certain identity-preserved commodities that have environmental performance attributes, like organic, like non-GMO, like certified palm oil, uh, if they're opaque, there are transaction costs there, and we should be able to, to bring transparency to that market by providing price data, and at the same time, we should let people physically trade those commodities as well. And again, uh, very liquid exchanges throw off a ton of data that then goes out into the marketplace, gives people price signals, lets them manage risk. Uh, so that is what Mercaris is. And I'll leave you with the thought before I pass the mic on that, you know, that delta between a bushel of organic corn and a bushel of conventional corn is what we as a society are saying we are willing to pay for, you know, pick a benefit. Reduced pesticide use, increased biodiversity, better farm worker health, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what that difference in price really means. Um, so uh, I look forward to the discussion and, and you know, we'll hopefully we can get some good back and forth going. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Brooke Randall, uh, and at ACM, we grow food. And I emphasize the term food instead of agriculture because I think it brings a slightly different perspective and lens on, on what it is that we do. 
Uh, we are really driven by the need to produce more sustainably grown and nutritious food. So if you look at organic as a category or subcategory within that, you know, organic's about 5% of our total food supply. We believe that number should be higher. Uh, organic premiums, we believe, uh, are uh, too high in the marketplace today. And so we're really driven by the need to scale up uh, this industry. Uh, currently, we farm about 3,300 acres uh, across California and Oregon. Uh, we're focused primarily on permanent crops, so crops that grow on a tree, a bush, or a vine. So things like citrus, berries, table grapes, nuts. Uh, and we also uh, are vertically integrated. So we not only invest in the land, but we also are active in the packing of that produce as well as the marketing of it. And we believe that's the best way to produce a sustainably grown product is to be active throughout the entire value chain. Uh, we actually operate our farms ourselves. We do not lease them out to other farmers. And uh, while uh, we think of ourselves as a company and we act like a company, as Dave mentioned, we are also a fund manager, as you could probably tell by our very creative name. Uh, and despite that fact, we, as an investment firm, believe uh, in, a, in a few key aspects of what it means for us to be an investment firm. Uh, one is we believe strongly in benefit principles. So we've actually incorporated benefit company principles into our investment management legal documents with our investors. So we've actually written into our own articles that we need to incorporate the impact that we have on our suppliers, our customers, the communities in which we work. Uh, we also believe that it's very important to be active not only within the impact investing community that you're seeing here, but also it's important for us to go out and help to bring what we would think of as more traditional investors into these activities. So we're very proud to be investing on behalf of university endowments and state pension funds, which is the last point I would note that we also believe it's very important for us to try to provide the opportunity to invest in activities that are aligned with people's values and that we can provide that not only to institutions but effectively to the retail investor by investing on behalf of, again, state employee pension funds. So uh, that's a, a bit about who we are. Hello. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, my name is Craig Wishner with Farmland LP. We buy conventional farmland and convert it to organic, sustainable farmland as an investment fund. Uh, we have about 7,000 acres, about 6,000 acres or 50 miles east of San Francisco, uh, and another 1,000 acres up in Corvallis, Oregon. Um, and uh, we're just launching a new fund, a $250 million REIT, uh, which uh, uh, will basically take us to the next phase. But basically what we do is, uh, Whereas uh, ACM focuses on permanent crops, we focus on row crop land. 53% uh, of US farmland, there's $2.4 trillion worth of farmland in the US, and 53% uh, of it is used to grow two commodity crops, corn and soy. Uh, and that may be operationally efficient for farmers to grow the same crop year after year after year, but it's actually the worst way to manage the asset uh, of farmland itself. So we're really farmland uh, asset managers. Uh, we buy great row crop land, usually with great water rights, uh, and then plant pasture on two-thirds of it and bring back good successful sustainable agriculture rotations. So we plant this very high quality pasture on it, uh, bring in great cattle producers, great sheep producers, great pastured poultry producers. And that generates wonderful economics uh, for them and for us uh, as a landowner uh, for three to seven years. Uh, after three years, it gets certified organic. Somewhere between three and seven years, we've maximized that soil fertility. Uh, then we bring in organic vegetable farmers uh, on 10 to 20 percent of the land. They generate great economics on that land, and we lower their input costs because of all the soil fertility that that livestock phase is added. Uh, then we rotate in grain farmers for a couple of years uh, and then put it back in a pasture. So the farmers are always there. They're just rotating around a, a very reasonable uh, area. Uh, we get much better biological productivity because we're using healthy agricultural systems on the soil. Uh, better, that better biological pr productivity results in better economic 
costs uh, for both the farmers uh, and for the investors as well. Uh, so um, we've actually already proven our first um, kind of full rotation there. Uh, we have 783 acres already certified organic. Uh, the first parts of that have already gone through uh, a three-year pasture phase, uh, and this year are in uh, organic butternut squash, uh, which will be a very good uh, economic crop for us at the end of the year. Uh, and the whole thing is working very well. We've actually been increasing the revenues generated per acre by 50% per year since we got started. So uh, it's going quite well. And uh, that's Farmland LP. Great, thank you. So how many of, let's do a little, just a little survey of the audience here. So how many of you uh, represent investors or investment advisors? Show of hands, please. Great. H how many of you are entrepreneurs that are potentially uh, building products for the agricultural industry? Great. And how many of you represent uh, not-for-profits in the agricultural area? And lastly, how many of you represent uh, either regulators or government officials of one form or another, or agencies, et cetera? Well, that's a surprise. That's a surprise. All right, and so uh, how many of you currently are invested in agriculture in one way or another? And how many of you are interested in doing that? Terrific, thank you. Hey, so um, Kelly, when we think about the word organic and sustainable agriculture, uh, oftentimes we think of, uh, I think, a couple things. One is the small stakeholder farmer in Guatemala or Kenya. Uh, or we're thinking about uh, a one acre, two acre, 10 acre CSA kind of a, of a thing. And so why would those, why would a market that's like that be interested in a trading platform, let alone price discovery, let alone futures contracts. And so paint us a little picture of what the reality is today of the organic and sustainable agricultural marketplace. Sure. Well, it's definitely, you know, probably not news to, to anyone here that now, I mean, agriculture is a global market. And so it doesn't matter how small your holding is, you are subject to forces that are beyond your control, beyond your, your neighborhood or your region. And so these types of tools, having this type of data, having these types of tools is actually very helpful uh, to the smallholder. When we first started, I said, you know, I do want to provide data to the big companies. And in fact, Whole Foods was one of our first uh, customers. Um, but, you know, Whole Foods has got a lot of capacity. They've got a lot of, of horsepower uh, on staff. You know, it's the small family farm with, you know, 10 people that doesn't have the type of access to information that, that the big Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000 um, has. So that's, you know, sort of the value in that. And then connecting, of course, to broader markets. So the idea that you can uh, very efficiently uh, sell to a, a wider range of customers. I will say there's some controversy. When we first started, uh, we were looking at actually doing a futures market. Now, futures for organics are not the right reason for, not the right tool at this point for a whole lot of reasons. A lot of them have to do with the size of the market and, and liquidity. Um, however, there was a barrier. A lot of, we had a lot of farmers say, I'm a little bit nervous about doing some markets. And I call it the sort of nameless, faceless hedge fund trader problem, the idea that you're giving over your livelihood or control of your livelihood to some, some guy at a desk in London or New York who's you know, manipulating markets. And so that is a real fear when you talk about markets with, with smallholders. Let me, let me just continue on this path for a little bit. So, so, and I think this is a really important thing, which is that we're actually watching, I think, the, the volume of this market uh, increasing dramatically. And so, you know, I'm, I'm hoping maybe you can share an example of uh, one of your other uh, clients of the trading platform and data, which is one of the large uh, organic uh, dairy products companies. And, and as they start to cross over into, you know, multi-hundreds of millions of dollars of their cooperative product, uh, how does alfalfa pricing fit into this? And why are they, you know, why is this industry now actually of a scale that's very actually, I think, in some ways out of sync with what we mentally think about it as? Yeah, I mean, organic is big business now. It was $35 billion in sales in the U.S. last year alone. Worldwide, it's something like a $60 billion market. And gone are the days, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago even, when you could say, all right, you know, you pick up the phone, look for some organic corn, 
and someone you find it somewhere and then you put down the phone and you have like two weeks to think about it and then maybe you call up and buy it or maybe you don't. Uh, now it's moving, you know, quickly. And so we have a, um, a dairy company that, you know, the price of feed is the, one of the biggest variables in the margin on, on milk or other, other dairy products. And so keeping a very close eye on what organic feed prices are doing is critical to the business. And you could sort of take that analogy or that example and, you know, apply it across a wide variety. You know, every Fortune 500 now has an organic food line. So if you're operating in the dark and don't know about, you know, what's, what's, what's coming down the pike, you know, you have no idea what forward prices are for, you know, organic soybeans, you're at a disadvantage. So let me, let me turn to you two. And, and um, so is there an economic basis for sustainable farming and organic, or is this just a sort of a save the planet kind of thing? And are they at odds with each other? Uh, no, I think absolutely not. In fact, I mean, we tell our investors that we believe uh, that sustainability is going to significantly enhance our financial returns. Uh, I think as most of you will be familiar, uh, there's a, a significant distinction between the two because we've got, at least uh, in the U.S., a federal organic certification standard that allows you to actually sell certified organic food uh, at the store as compared to sustainable food, which broadly speaking across, across the food industry has no widely acknowledged uh, sustainability certification. There are subcategories of certain areas that have uh, particular certifications that folks are selling under in the meat space, for example, uh, but there really is no widely held sustainability certification. And yes, from an organic perspective, uh, I know this is uh, true for, for Craig, it's definitely true for us that from an economic perspective, uh, we not only benefit from those premiums that are being paid on organic today, but more importantly for us, we've actually been able to figure out how to actually improve and sometimes enhance yields on the crops with which we're involved in excess of conventional crops, kind of contrary to, to popular belief. And so the economic benefits for us on selling organic produce is phenomenal. Uh, you know, in today's market, broadly speaking, it's 20 to 30 percent higher from a returns perspective than we see on conventional produce. So uh, the we actually look at kind of three main price premiums. What, what we're basically doing is adding value to commodity agriculture. So uh, we look at uh, the certified organic price premium, uh, the sustainably produced price premium, grass-fed beef, uh, pasture-raised eggs, uh, and then the locally grown uh, price premium. Uh, and uh, that, in fact, the locally grown probably has the uh, uh, most pull. For example, if you offer someone a uh, organic peach from Chile uh, or a locally grown conventional peach, they'll actually take the locally grown one twice as often, twice as much uh, as the conventionally one. And so the, these price premiums, uh, only some of them actually convert back to truly sustainable agriculture practices. Uh, and that's what we focus on. We, we actually uh, look at the price premiums that we get from those as a great uh, uh, revenue uh, benefit for us, and we look at the sustainable agriculture practices as actually reducing our input costs more, effect more efficiently and more effectively utilizing the resources, utilizing the land, uh, and the two together uh, result in a much more profitable business. Uh, not all businesses are the same. Uh, you kind of have to know what you're buying and, and, and why you're doing it, uh, but in combination they're very, very powerful. But I do think that the awareness of even if you get in by organic, but you're buying factory farmed, essentially uh, organic, it's still worthwhile because it does shift behavior. Uh, it gets people out of the mindset that all food is the same, uh, and it gets people really kind of more connected, at least a little bit, uh, to the land, and that's that's can be transformational. No, I just want to add one more thing. You know, both of what Craig and I were just speaking of is primarily on the sales, on the revenue side of things, what the, the pricing looks like for those crops. I just want to note that sustainability in agriculture is really just farming 101, right? We're always looking at how are we managing and reducing inputs while still optimizing yields. So we look at that both from an environmental perspective as far as lessening our environmental impact, whether that's water, fertilizer, et cetera, but also that has a consequential economic impact, right? Which is how are we reducing costs for the farms that we're managing? 
One of the things that we uh, have been reading about is the, uh, uh, it's a funny thing, I mean, you know, agriculture has been uh, obviously a main industry uh, since uh, uh, our humankind. And, and yet over the last 10 years or so, it's become a, a, a pretty top of mind investor topic. And we keep reading about the amount of money that keeps coming into this sector. And I'm wondering if you guys can talk a little bit about uh, is there reality in that? And is there, you know, what kind of money is coming into this uh, uh, marketplace? And, and maybe touch a little bit on what are some of the downsides if, in fact, there's a lot of money coming into this? So, to put it in perspective, there's $2.4 trillion worth of farmland in the U.S. That compares, that's about the same size actually as the value of all the office buildings, commercial office buildings in the U.S. It's the same size as all the apartment buildings in the U.S., all the shopping malls in the U.S. And actually if you add up all of the forms of commercial real estate, uh, which is around over $15 trillion, plus farmland, uh, you're around $18 trillion or so. Uh, and the value of all the U.S. publicly traded companies is around $18.5 trillion. So really, you, and you have almost no awareness of real assets, let alone farmland. And in fact, that's expressed in the percentages, which is out of the $2.4 trillion worth of farmland in the US, well, only about $25 billion, 1%, is actually owned by institutional investors. 40% okay? of US farmland is leased, but uh, it's often done by the descendants of the people who, uh, who have this farmland. So you are seeing a lot of capital flow into the space. The estimate that I've seen is around $10 billion worth of capital flowing into the space. Um, and that's on the surface a lot of capital, but you know, the average age of farmer is 58 years old uh, today. They're dying, they're, they're passing the land on. The people who already got their farmland are passing that on. Uh, about one to 4% of farmland is changing hands each year. So what that means over the next 10 years, you're talking about 250 billion to $1 trillion worth of farmland changing hands in 10 years. So $10 billion is really a, a, a drop in the bucket. The question is, who's gonna be buying that farmland? What kind of agricultural practices are they gonna use on that farmland? And my concern is that it's all gonna go to uh, chemical dependent commodity farmers uh, and the organic sustainable side is going to be basically left in the lurch. So, or uh, uh, still a small and insignificant part of it for the next 10 to 20 years. So my goal really uh, is to actually educate people because there is a lot of capital flowing in. A lot of it's not going to intelligent places. Um, I'll just, so uh, Farmland Partners Incorporated just went public fairly recently. And if you read their prospectus and you're a sophisticated investor, your eyes rolled back in your head and uh, and then if you look at their farmland purchases that they just made with their uh, IPO proceeds, which is just due north of the uh, uh, Oklahoma Dust Bowl spot, uh, and they're just doing sale leaseback financing, sale leaseback purchases for commodity cropland, adding zero value to this. It's, some of these things are just kind of disasters. It's like a slow motion train wreck. Um, and uh, so really what, what I hope we're all doing is actually educating people about the different forms of agriculture. There's different forms of office buildings, different forms of real estate all over. There's different types of farmland. There's different kinds of managers. The more educated people are, uh, my hope is that the capital will go to the right place. It is a space that deserves a lot of capital. Good managers really do add a lot of value both economically and sustainably uh, to it. Uh, but uh, the investors have to be educated. I think I, I, I would just add, and I agree with much of, of what Craig said. Uh, there is a massive transition happening in, in American farming. The, as Craig said, if you put all that together over the next 20 to 30 years, you're talking about 70% of US farmland changing hands. Uh, there is going to be a massive transition. And when you look at it, the challenge, the one challenge in particular that larger institutional investors are having moving into the space today is finding farm managers. And really, I, I would emphasize farm operators, folks who can actually operate farms at the scale that is required. So the average size of a farm in the US today is 400 acres, right? With the transition that we're talking about, you need farmers 
who can operate on the scale of thousands of acres and tens of thousands of acres. Now you have that in places in the Midwest today in the row crop industry, but as Craig said, those are not folks who are necessarily executing on the types of practices that I think we all wanna be supporting. So we've got a significant challenge as a country, as a society, to try to help improve the professionalization of farm managers in this country to be able to work at the scale that's coming to us over the next 20 years. So we're going to see a tremendous amount of supply of farmlands change hands. We're seeing equally on the uh, capital side uh, uh, plenty of capital coming in, if not more. Uh, what are we seeing from your perspective in terms of corporations and, and other investors' interests in, in this? Well, I would just add that in, term, in, in, in addition to the, the asset of, of farmland itself, there's a lot of running room for uh, on the technology and data side. So last year, uh, you saw Climate Corp sell the Monsanto for just under a billion dollars. And that is you know, precision data and precision ag. Uh, there's, uh, I don't know how many startups I've heard of in the last year and a half to two years that are providing essentially enter enterprise software at the farm level. Uh, so for whether you're an investor and an entrepreneur, there's a lot of, you know, ag has got a lot of space and I agree that there's room for more capital to come in without creating, you know, things like bubbles. Um, I do think, you know, Dave and I were talking about this earlier, there's a there's a, a lack of people who can connect the dots. So you see folks that um, know a lot about what's going on in the farm side, but they're not necessarily connected to what consumers are, are asking about. Or you see a lot of innovative consumer-facing products, you know, new brands and that sort of thing, with not an idea of how ag operates in real time. Uh, so those types of, I, I do see a need for, for, for more of those types of, of connectors. And then finally, I think there's a role for good old-fashioned project finance. And in some ways, ag isn't different from any other sector, from water, from, you know, from other heavy infrastructure. There's aging infrastructure. Uh, some of the new, now that we've got uh, consumer demand for things like uh, identity preserved, you know, traits, even if it's not organic, even if it's something like a high oil type of corn or, and you've got, there's not, there's no facilities, there are not enough facilities to handle that type of these types of specialized needs that are coming that you're seeing more and more in the ag supply chain. So um, I would put that out there. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question, but. <laughs> uh, capital. <laughs> oh, capital. Yeah, I'll, uh, maybe I'll just say we just are. My fingers are crossed. We're raising around. So these, uh, my business is actually not very, is fairly capital efficient. We raised a small seed round, 750,000, um, and now we're getting ready to close an A round. So. Um, uh, and our interest came from, I mean, we did go to some of the traditional VCs. Uh, we ended up uh, getting a lot of interest from family funds. Family funds are very heavy in the ag space. Uh, so I would say, you know, family funds, there are some traditional VCs that get it, but they're, you know, they're harder to find. A lot of VCs used to invest in, oh, you know, land or biotech or, and so finding something that, that's these VCs that are, that are nimble and can take advantage of new opportunities is, is I think, more needed. All right, so, so there's an underlying theme here, and it's, uh, it's a, a, again, a little bit of a controversial theme, and that is uh, scaling, uh, consolidation, aggregation. And, uh, and this flies in the face of, uh, I call it the romance that we have about farming, and that is uh, the red barn, mom and dad and the family. And, and I'd love, to, I'd love your perspective on, is this just basically a huge path right now to consolidation and big, you know, sort of 100,000 acre industrialized farming? Or how do you think, how do you guys think? Because look, you guys are both raising large blocks of capital, 250 in your next uh, REIT structure. Uh, you're managing institutional capital from pension plans. And, and there's a demand for those investors to continue to be able to deploy large blocks of capital. So how do you guys see in your strategy the role of small and big, or is it small versus big? Take your time. This is a tough one. So, um this is a really important conversation, obviously, in the agricultural community, but I, I think even more so, the framing that I think about it is in the you know, health of rural communities across America. Um, 
I, in my mind, that's what we're really talking about. Again, when you look at agriculture as an industry, this is really the last major sector of the economy that has yet to really experience the impact of our uh, essentially kind of global capitalist markets, right? You know, where else can you find, again, you know, very small, uh, oftentimes family-run producers who are providing the, the vast majority of the activity in the economy. You know, the, we used to have a thousand automobile makers, now we have how many? Um, five. You know, that, it is going to happen in this industry. Uh, but I also, to, to, uh, to Craig's point earlier, again, remember less than 1% of U.S. farmland is institutionally owned today. And I think that when you look at the inefficiency of this industry, you've got to balance out from a food justice perspective, from an equity perspective, that the inefficiency of this industry, the brunt of that is born on the poor of this country. If you look at it from a food access perspective, that's the impact of the inefficiency of this industry. So I think we've got to balance out how this industry is going to become more efficient. And I do believe that it will become more efficient with larger professionally managed farms. Uh, but we've got to be able to balance that out with retaining opportunities for uh, small family operations, again, typically in rural communities. For us, there's a, a couple of things we can do there. Uh, one is uh, we provide more opportunities for packing and processing on farm, at farm, in rural communities. So it's one of the economic development opportunities that we're able to provide for folks. We are also able to provide some of our services, uh, food safety services, uh, marketing services to smaller farmers that they typically otherwise would not be able to afford or undertake themselves. So we're able to provide them with a connection into that organic marketplace that they're not able to get otherwise. Um, and we also just simply acknowledge that this is a significant challenge, again, for the U.S. You know, I participate in a CSA uh, myself at home because I believe that we've got to do that to continue to support rural communities, but it's a significant challenge. You know, I actually think it goes back to uh, U.S. agricultural policy, 1971, Secretary of Agriculture Earl Butts saying, uh, uh, get big or get out. Farm fence post to fence post. Grow all you can and we'll provide you with price supports and insurance. And, and, it's, and these are family farmers, right, who, uh, who are on 53% of U.S. cropland growing corn and soy in unsustainable methods. So if you, I, I really try to look at the data and what does the data tell me? The data tells me that the current agricultural system is really a freight train just kind of going one direction. The land ownership issue to me is actually less important. The, the, and I think actually there's a way to optimize it and fix the problem. The current structure, the romantic idea that we have is basically one farmer owns one piece of land and the laws of economics say he needs to specialize, they need to specialize on one kind of crop. Well, that's the worst way to manage farmland. That's not how it was managed for thousands of years. So when we look at farmland, we look at it the same way as you would look at a commercial office building. Uh, corporations, since the 1960s, when REITs were created, uh, they, uh, corporations were selling off their, land, their buildings uh, to REITs basically. And these REIT managers were able to actually make very efficient use of this real estate, find the best uh, tent house, penthouse tenant, find the best retail tenants in the bottom, and the best businesses in between uh, to be tenants. And when I, as a business owner, wanted to grow my business, I didn't have to buy a new office building. I just got more space. Well, today, the organic farmers, if they want to double the size of their business because there's tremendous customer demand, they have to buy a whole new piece of farmland go into great debt, spend three years converting that land to certified organic farmland, and then that fourth year, all, everything that they grow, they have to sell it all just to hopefully kind of keep up. Uh, and by that time, hopefully their business has grown. It's a very inefficient system. And so what we actually use our fund is to buy the farmland, convert it to organic, and let those farmers who are already, they already own their own land. They already have some land, but they have lots more customer demand. And so they can expand into our land just like they would into an office building uh, if they were to grow. And we make sure that the land is managed sustainably. Uh, so you know, it doesn't, it's not a story about who owns the land or who doesn't, and we actually hope to have the REIT uh, go public so that really everybody 
is now owners of this land. They're really reconnected with it, and more land can be converted to these methods. Um, it's not so much who owns it, but it really is about what kind of agricultural practices are they using on the land. We view our farmland as a platform for entrepreneurialism for those family farmers, actually, to get back on the land build up to the scale that's required by today's uh, customers and by today's economic systems uh, and, be, and be very thriving and successful without that worry about going bankrupt or losing their land or, or anything like that. So in our uh, rent systems are designed to be in line with theirs, either revenue sharing or profit sharing. So it's a much more nuanced conversation, um, but it's a very important one to have that maybe the old economic system that we had was kind of part of the problem to some extent, uh, and we have to be willing to put everything on the table for something as important as sustainable food production. So I think that um, the work that Brooke and Craig are doing is so important because, you know, what, what organic and sustainable ag always gets slammed for is, well, can you feed the world and can you do it cheaply? I mean, our system is really good at turning out cheap, you know, corn. Uh, we're, we're great at it. We're efficient at it. It's brilliant, except it's been, you know, ruining things at the, you know, soil in terms of, in terms of soil and water and, you know, some would say human health as well. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so organic, you know, the idea is, you know, can organic feed the world and can it do it at a place, uh, not just environmentally sustainably, but at a price that people can afford. You know, I have members of my family can, that can afford to pay $8 a gallon for organic grass-fed milk. And I have members of my family who are on food stamps and they need, you know, cheap milk. Um, so th the idea that can you bridge that gap and can you do things like increasing yield? You know, organic, I don't think has had a fair shot yet. It's like the saying, you know, Ginger Rogers did everything except backwards and in high heels. You know, organic doesn't, hasn't had the subsidies. It hasn't had, you know, you've still got to haul organic grain, you know, 500 miles to find a place that'll process it. And so I think the, it's, the question is to be determined whether the, the scale can happen and happen in a way that can, can significantly shift the system. And I think it's, um, I would encourage everyone here to think big because the only way to, to counter those arguments is just to do it. And this conversation here is the, is the way that happens. So we, we actually have proof that uh, grass-fed beef is actually more profitable than corn-fed beef. About 10 years ago, it actually crossed over that line where actually feeding, growing all this corn and feeding it to livestock in a feedlot uh, that actually became more expensive than actually just having a pasture on cropland and producing the same amount of meat per acre as you did if you put all those inputs into the ground and plowed it and harvested and shipped it off to a feedlot. So there are a lot of myths actually that we have in our head and actually this feed the world thing is literally a Monsanto talking point. It is Crop Life International funded by Monsanto lobbying so that we could do more corn production. Oh, and by the way, the corn goes into our fuel tanks. <laughs> so it's absolutely not about feeding the world. Anyone who says feed the world really truly doesn't know what they're talking about. It's a lobbying talking point that they're parroting and you really gotta look underneath it. You can actually produce more food per acre, more profitably using sustainable agriculture practices. We believe it does need to be done at scale. Uh, in order to uh, really be effective, so. You know, one of the things that, that uh, you know, I've been most fascinated by uh, uh, is, is the increasing sophistication in the use of data in farming. And, you know, it, I, I'm, I'm reminded of a recent visit that I took out to one of the largest dairies in the United States. And, uh, and the fact that uh, they have 35,000 dairy cattle uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a breeding stock of another 40,000. And because they have the genetic and the health history, uh, uh, they implemented uh, uh, health records before Obamacare uh, for their cows. They've come to the conclusion that uh, they only have about 1% uh, of their, of their um, herd that is chronically ill and they euthanize those which allows them to take the other 35,000 cows off of antibiotics. And, and that's because they now have the health records and the data and they can tell when a cow is just sick versus chronically ill. And, and so, so this has had profound impact on, well, you know, now they're, now they're not putting any Biotics, and it wasn't an organic issue. It was just wow, there's no reason to do this. And they find this kind of, and you're finding, you know, drone usage. You're finding 
uh, water, especially now in California, water monitoring, water management, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm wondering, from a human resource standpoint and a training standpoint, what's the farmer of the next 10 years look like? And um, maybe this is a little bit of a jaded question, but um, and where are you going to find them? And is it a different individual than what uh, has traditionally come out of our ag schools? Well, I can tell you, for, for us, the folks that we're hiring out of school are folks who have much more of a you know, systems thinking perspective. So we're hiring engineers, biologists, you know, folks from the sciences, uh, as much as we are hiring folks from the ag schools. Um, and that's exactly for that reason that you mentioned that you know we we uh, we're interviewing a uh, a uh, potential you know senior level farm manager uh, somebody who'd been in farming for 30 years you know knows farming knows agronomy uh, extremely well uh, but I, I I say this in all seriousness I, I don't think he had turned on a computer uh, in 10 or 15 years. And the reality of what you mentioned today is, you know, how we work on farm today, whether it's developing nutrition programs, whether it's, you know, soil moisture monitoring technology, you know, all of our farm managers today all have iPads, right? They all live out of their trucks. They've got a remote office in their truck. They've got access to the vast majority of the data that they need uh, remotely. And it's, it's, those are the folks that we're hiring. Uh, and the egg schools are starting to change in their education around that. Uh, but again, we, we've got just as many engineers and scientists as we do folks coming out of the, the ag program um, because we need that kind of thinking uh, and with the level of technology that we're using today. I think it's exciting because what it, what it really does say is that there's, uh, uh, because of this uh, transition I think that's taking place in farming, we have a tremendous opportunity for the young. Uh, and, and, quote, unquote, the professionalization uh, uh, and sophistication of, of the field. The other thing, and this is just a straw poll, I always ask this question when I'm at uh, large farms, is, uh, 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 you know, where are they getting these students? And they're getting these students, exactly what like you said, from very uh, alternative programs, non-traditional ag programs. And there's also uh, an interesting um, uh, uh, gender issue. There are now far more, some of the most... I think the most innovative practices that are taking place are driven by, oftentimes, by women farmers, uh, women professionals that are entering this field. So even there, I think we've got some a, a, a tremendous amount of shakeup that's starting to take place in this in this in this area. Uh, yeah, my my business partner manages uh, two large, you know, 150 and 200 acre center pivots from his iPhone. So turns it on, stops it. We have water sensors in the ground. So it's incredibly labor efficient nowadays. I think the intellectual level is, is and scientific knowledge is really quite high. The average farmer in the U.S. has between four million and eight million dollars uh, worth of farmland and equipment today. So these are mostly the commodity farmers. That's kind of the minimum barrier to entry to get into this business. And so the real question for me is you have really brilliant, passionate people coming out of college, but I don't know how many of them have both the education and knowledge level and the four and a half to eight million dollars to plunk down and, and get started. So I actually think this is a kind of, uh, you know, launch to the moon uh, problem that we have in the United States is how do we get that next generation of farmers uh, who are much more systems minded and sustainability minded uh, back onto the land into some of these uh, into some of these businesses. Let's open it up for questions out there. Uh, do we have microphones? Great. And then if you would just uh, maybe just give us your name and what you're affiliated with and uh, and your question back there. Yes, hi, I'm Wendy Richards, and I'm an outsourced chief marketing officer for investment funds, and I currently uh, work for uh, a large investment fund. I am also individually, uh, personally, uh, an investor in some uh, sustainable um, real estate properties. Uh, the, qu the question I have is, is related to the capital, and, it, and I'd like to ask you, David, as well as the panelists, which is what are the lessons for the large capital providers? David, you've worked a lot in, in funneling assets to the space, and you've 
talk to investors, each of you. What lessons do you have for the investors? What are you looking for? What kinds of investors do you turn down? What do, uh, how do you structure your products to entice investors? Why did you choose a REIT? You know, these are the questions from the investor. How do we become better investors? Great. You guys want to take a crack at that and I'll, I'll clean up? Huh? <laughs> all right. Um, okay, so... All right, so, so, so going into 2007, 2008, uh, I think one of the most powerful things that actually happened uh, in the downturn was that we got back to investment basics. So the universal truth in the 2000s was everything should pay you 12%. Every CIO uh, knew better but forgot. Every portfolio manager of an institutional fund forgot. And they forgot, and that part of it was also because of Wall Street got so creative across every asset class that every asset class became a spectrum of risk. It used to be in the good old days, the reason you invested and built a huge real estate portfolio and kept it for a long, long period of time were two reasons. One, it was highly stable, and if it clipped a 6% inflation-adjusted coupon, that's what it was supposed to do for your portfolio. That was its risk profile, that was its function, and that's what you held it for. The second word was duration. In general, you probably had a long duration obligation and you wanted duration match your asset. All right? So it fulfilled a purpose in your portfolio. In the 2000s and the run-up and arguably in the, 19, uh, you know, the 1990s, but really in the 2000s, we forgot all that. 2007, 2008 taught us, uh, brought us back to basically risk, how do you layer a portfolio, and the proper function of proper assets. So, so, so one of the bugaboos in this industry in impact investing is that we all get convinced that there's some universal quote unquote market rate of return. So we argue about market rates. So I like to ask my students, well good, for the last five years if you operated a treasury bond portfolio, what was considered good? 25 basis points? So if you were a 60 basis point, 75 basis points performer, you killed it. It's all relative. So, so one of the most important things to think about when you think about agriculture is what function do you want it to have in your portfolio? All right? And, and it's meant to be a long-term stable, counter-cyclical, inflation hedge, asset protection mechanism. It's not meant to give you 17, 18 percent kinds of rates of return. For that, you should go to a much higher risk portfolio. All right. So one of the things for ag investors is understand what layer of your portfolio you're trying to put it into. Understand the second thing, which is duration. And this is another thing that I think that, that the most sophisticated CIOs are starting to understand, which is somehow along the way we forgot that the 10-year fund life was an artifact of tax policy. Somehow we thought it was some local maximization of something. All right. And so one of the things that's starting to happen with the most sophisticated CIOs is they're asking a really interesting question. And by the way, you know, the consultants are catching up to this. And that is, well, geez, if you guys are such great operators and you've built this wonderful asset and you're clipping me a stabilized coupon and there's an embedded appreciation in this, and by the way, I'm a pension plan, so I have at least a rolling 30-year obligation and presumably a 100-year kind of obligation. Um, why do I want to force you to sell it? Because that would mean I'm tantamount to starting the business afresh again 10 years from now. Minus the capital gain. Minus capital gains, minus buying cycles, all that. So, so, so the most sophisticated investors are now starting to ask the question, what can I do to have my cake and eat it too, which is semi-liquidity, the ability to have some level of exit inflows and outflows, but the optionality of keeping the asset for a long period of time. All right. So we're starting to see uh, in these fixed assets, hard assets or real assets, a rethinking about the structure. We're thinking back to what role do they play in the portfolio, and we're getting to a much more rational understanding of, of, of what the appropriate rate of return and the adjusted rate of return should be for that asset. All right. I think that's what we're seeing that, that's, 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 that's most interesting. So I, I will contrast that from three years ago to today. Three years ago when we first started talking about, hey, you know, we kind of got creative and that this portfolio can actually be converted into a long live vehicle. Ooh, can't do that. 
today the conversation is, hey, can we do a side letter that allows us to retain this asset beyond its 10-year life? Because, well, geez, you know. So we're watching a very, very rapid shift in, in, in this. And, and we're watching the compensation mechanism for some of the large portfolio managers uh, really beginning to, to, I think, correspond to this. So one of the, the, the portfolio managers that, that, that invested in, in, in our ag product would tell you very openly, if, if I'm supposed to hit a 6% target, if, if my portfolio returns, year one is 12, year two is zero, year three is seven, year five, year four is five, I may not get my bonus because it averaged out to six because I had huge volatility. I get my bonus if I hit five and a half, six and a half, five and a half, six and a half, six, six, seven, all right? Because that's the role I'm supposed to play, all right? So we're seeing, I think, a remarkable uh, level of, of risk sophistication come back into, and these are all the things you're supposed to learn in your finance class. Do you guys want to take a crack at that? You did great. All right. Back there. Hi, thank you. Uh, Will Lana with Trillium Asset Management. And I just had a quick question for, uh, for Ms. James about this organic price premium, uh, the difference between organic and conventional. Do you have a sense the last few years or recently, is that premium growing? Is it decreasing? You said there's this goal here to, to have that premium shrink over time. And when you're talking to different organic farmers or groups, do you think when they're modeling out or looking forward, are they expecting and are they trying to protect that premium and keep it in place or are they planning on that premium to decline over time? You should subscribe to our data set and we'll, uh, yeah, we'll <laughs> you'll, you'll have all, <laughs> always be selling, right? Um, no, it's a good question. Uh, you can look historically and see that there is, you know, there's, a, there's a sort of, sometimes you'll hear people say organic is 2x conventional. That's actually not true. On the grain side, you've seen anything from uh, one and a half to four times conventional over the past you know, three years. And organic farmers are definitely interested in protecting that price premium. One of the challenges for organic that happened last year, year and a half ago, is we had the drought and then com conventional commodity prices spiked. So you were seeing like seven, eight dollar corn. That actually was putting pressure on organic farmers because you can make a really nice living with eight dollar corn and with organic at, you know, ten, eleven dollars at the same time, the, the premium actually shrunk. Now, uh, some of those farmers who maybe got out are, you know, are singing a different tune because we're seeing $3.50 corn and organic corn at $12, $13 a bushel. So, you know, it's the, the delta, the basis is very volatile. Um, it absolutely plays into the, the decisions at farm level. Um, and, you know, that's, that's our job is to report that so that people can, you know, whether you're an asset manager or whether you're, a, you know, whether you're an asset manager because you're a farmer or whether you're an asset manager because you're trying to keep track of what, where investment opportunities are, that, that data is important. Um, so from a big trend perspective as well, you have to remember that uh, the uh, organic food market is over 4% of the U.S. food budget. Uh, and it's over about $34 billion a year. Uh, and the uh, certified organic farmland is only around 1% uh, of U.S. farmland. That's only growing at about 8.5% per year. So you have really you know, a, a, the demand market in, in, continuing to skyrocket, uh, but the supply of organic farmland, which is needed to grow organic crops, uh, really uh, not keeping up. Uh, and so that's why there's a big opportunity. That's why we think the price premiums will will be maintained uh, and um, and the markets will continue. How about one more question and I'm going to throw a curveball uh, up here. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm leading a United Nations Environment Program uh, project in Colombia and Peru. And my question goes more into the uh, yeah, international discussion. And this is all very much uh, United States focused. Um, so I don't know if you have any ideas. Uh, you started with uh, the small landholders from Guatemala. We are focusing on 2.5 billion uh, small landholders worldwide, working mostly with data management and software. So can this we are creating an asset class. Can, is there an opportunity to have um, access to, to price data? But also, if I present triple bottom line returns, is there an interest for investors? Yeah. So just, just quickly, I mean, we, focused, we started focusing on the U.S. and, and Canada and North America just because we had to start somewhere. But already we're looking at um, coffee. We're looking at a number of soft commodities where the supply is outside of the U.S. The demand 
for organic anyway, still comes largely from the U.S. That's about half, and then Europe, another you know 40 percent, and then you know the balance by Canada and Japan. So I think there's a real growing opportunity because there are you know these domestic markets that are overseas uh, for organics. I think are growing, but so far that's why our focus has been you know on the U.S. to start. Yeah, I, I think that what. Um Kelly is doing actually has tremendous, tremendous implication for the small stakeholder farmers and specifically for the uh, the co-ops. And I, I don't know if this is okay to talk about, but maybe you can talk a little bit about the, the, whole, the whole potential upcoming sesame. I mean, that's absolutely right at the heart of, of, of small stakeholders. Yeah, farmers. to give you an example of how this can impact the supply farmers in, in developing countries, we're looking at doing a, an organic sesame seed auction. And this is, you know, very small far farmers, one hectare, two hectares in uh, Africa, in Uganda, uh, and it's opening up new markets for them. So it's 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 income for for small farmers, and it's you know our, our job is to lower the transaction fees and, and increase transparency. So that's that's what good markets do. And, and so, you know, just to give you a scale for that, this is what a two point at, at the cover level for about two point five million dollars of of product. Yeah, about a thousand metric tons. A thousand metric tons, about two point five million dollars, but it's now creating a more efficient marketplace, and the 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 supply side for that two point five million a thousand metric tons of sesame is again small farmers. And so you're creating something that is, I mean, you know, you imagine yourself, right? You're some small farmer in Tanzania, and now you're, you're technically visible to the global markets. And the offtake on this are large bakers, large hummus makers, large food producers. So it, 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 this, is, this does have huge implications, and it's very really exciting. The other thing is, the dirty little secret in the United States is that uh, a huge proportion of our organic grains are imported from South America because we don't have that much land. And so again, this is actually a global marketplace and we don't typically think of it that way. All right, I know we're coming on short on time. I have one question and uh, again, no great answers. Um, you guys have a position on GMO? <laughs> wow, here you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have a degree in biochemistry and molecular biology. When I was in high school, I wanted to start a genetically modified pet store. So I like the technology. I think that genetic modification is a tool, and unfortunately, I think it's being used uh, in a very bad way. Uh, I think it's being used to promote unsustainable agriculture practices, such as large-scale, repetitive, year-after-year monocropping. And that's a poor use of the technology, and it's affected by subsidies and other things. Um, and. Uh, our fund, we, we get our land certified organic, so we actually don't use it on our land. Um, but the technology could be good, uh, but it's really not being used that way. Yeah, the, the short of it is I would agree with Craig. It's, uh, um, uh, I personally have my own uh, fears, as I think many people do. I think when you actually look at the science today, there is a lot of competing science there. You know, we're a member of the non-GMO working group. There is, you know, still not uh, truly agreed upon from a peer-reviewed academic perspective what the impacts are. There's still a lot that we don't know, but I think the execution of it today has been horrible. Again, I agree with, with Craig from a, you know, monocrop biodiversity perspective, uh, you know, it, uh, if you look at how it's being implemented implemented and executed, that I think is the biggest risk. Uh, there's still a lot that we, that we don't know. And you got to label it. Yes. Yeah, you have to label it. Um, I, I will take a little bit of a contrarian. I mean, we report prices for non-GMOs. We obviously have an interest in non-GMO and organic continuing to exist and grow. But when you talk to farmers, a lot of times, you know, we mentioned the fact that the average farmer is closing on 60 years old. They're managing a thousand acres of land with like half a dozen people. Um, GMOs have been a labor-saving device. It's the only way you can work 2,000 acres with three people. You, you just, that's what they're using it for. So I think it's important to understand if, if you want to change agriculture and change what the normal practice is, then I think it it's helps us all to take a clear-eyed look at why people are doing it. And the fact that, you know, you know who your seed dealer is, you know, how, where are you going to get the non-GMO seed? Is it out there? Where are you going to take it? You're going to haul it to the local elevator? Are you going to, you know, do you know who's going to buy it? So those types of questions are the types of questions that consume me. And I spend, I think this, the system will shift if we solve for those questions. Hey, you guys have been great. Thank you so much.